old age and treachery before youth and skill. Happy birthday, dear dad. Happy birthday to you. Woo! Here's Melanie and George sitting on the patio smoking. Drinking her coffee. Good morning, babe. Good morning, babe. Good morning, Mama. <laughs> Whoa, shit. That was awesome. Did you see that, that one? That was awesome. Did you get that? I got that. There you go, get him. And the parents of the group, George and Charlene Harrison. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Yay. Shit. Say shit. There you go. Still long. <laughs> you look thrilled. <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna go wait outside. Alright, let's see your haircut, Dad. There you go. Looks good. I like it. Nice and clean.
on behalf of President of the United States, the United States Army, and our grateful nation. Please accept this flag as a symbol of our appreciation for love's honorable and faithful service. Thank you all for joining us today. For those of you who do not know me, I am Charlene's son, George's stepson, Anthony Retz. Before we continue with our celebration of life service, my mom would like to say thank you all. Thank you to you all for her wonderful, and her li wonderful lady friends here in White Hills. You dearest ladies and men that have helped out so graciously in undertaking the preparation of all the hall and all the food for today's service. She would like you all to know that she feels so very blessed to have so many wonderful friends and sisters in the Lord. It is our family's hope that when you leave here today, you will be feeling lighthearted and not heavy-hearted. Yes, it is a mournful day, but we are going to focus on George George's life who he was, his accomplishments, and his failures. Everything that made him the man he was. If you do not know George very well, or maybe not even at all, when you leave here, you will have a good understanding of who he was and why he was loved by so many. Thank you all for coming here today and supporting our family during our time of loss. My sister Dawn will now come up for a reading of Ecclesiastes 3, 1 8. Mm -hmm. hey guys, thank you for coming. Uh, this is Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 through 8. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born. <sighs> and a time to die. A time to plant, a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill, and a time to heal. Time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away every stone and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to, te to tear, tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Please, everyone, join us in as we sing Heaven Came Down and Glory Filled My Soul. I picked that song because that's how I... how I... Uh, see what happened um, at George's passing. So, um, thank you everybody for coming here, supporting us during this time of morning uh, loss. 
we're not going to mourn so much today, but we're going to we're going to enjoy George's life. I'll put it that way. <laughs> he was quite a character. Um, I hope you guys have all got to see, look, you know, after, even afterwards, look around and see some of these pictures. I intended on having a video uh, to, but I, uh, to show as I was speaking, but I just couldn't get it done. And uh, so many pictures to go through and so much to do. And um, I was really close, but I am going to finish it for my own benefit, you know, and then maybe give that to my uh, family members who, who would like one. Um, who would like it, but Melanie made all these beautiful picture collages of George and uh, his life, and um, I, I ordered these, and I, let me tell you a little sh quick story about these. I had ordered these, uh, the canvas ones, and uh, paid expedited shipping, paid expediting uh, processing, Got it ordered. The next day, they sent me an email and said, "I'm so we're sorry, but we won't be able to get those to you until January the 7th. Uh. <laughs> and I uh, immediately, I was like, that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So I, I wrote a few, not nasty, but <laughs> mad emails, right? <laughs> Demanding a full refund and uh, telling them what these were for and everything. and Because they, they had already shipped them ground. Lo and behold, when did we get them, Kylie? Yesterday? They showed up. They showed up yesterday. And so, first thing Kylie said was, that's a miracle. That's from God. Right? And Because uh, I had actually gotten two emails. One stating that they would be here on the 7th, and they bumped it up to the 5th. Well, still no good to me. So I sent off another mad email. But we were so blessed to get these because I really wanted... Uh, to have some pictures and, and then Melanie made all those and everything. So take a walk around as you listen to me, um, not as you listen to me, after um, I'm done speaking, and look at these pictures and you'll say, oh yeah, she talked, she said about that, she said about that. So anyway, um, George C. Harrison was born on October the 12th, 1943. Legend has it that he was born on a rock in the desert. At least Melanie believed that until she was about 23 or so. And it's, uh, yeah. So, thank you for joining us to celebrate and honor George's life as he lived it and as he told me about it. I can never include all the aspects of his life but I will do my best to share with you his life as he told it to me on so many occasions. It will be as accurate as possible, or as Georgie would say, close enough for government work. <laughs> Childhood. George was born in Meriden, Connecticut. His mother told him that she went there with her fam uh, to be with her family to birth him. She they were here in Las Vegas, then she went there. She and baby George returned to Nevada shortly afterwards. However, later in his life, he would have many questions regarding his birth, as I will explain later. Discovering a scandalous history somehow, it seemed, somewhat fitting for George's life story. <laughs> <laughs> the construction of the Hoomer Dam it, it, is the, it was the constructor of the, of the Hoover Dam that brought his parents to Nevada. <clears throat> like so many other men after the war, his father, who was a pilot, came here for work and remained in Nevada where he would raise his family. His father worked on the Hoover Dam and the Davis Dam, which is Laughlin Dam. Uh, George grew up in North Las Vegas in the 40s and the 50s and graduated from Rancho High School in 1960. The family of four lived in an 8 by 40 new moon trailer. It had an ice box for refrigeration, a swamp cooler on one end, and the tiniest little bathroom you'd ever seen, George said. <laughs> His mother made their clothes and she canned their food. I cannot tell you how many times we laughed about one particular shirt that he told me about. Hammers and saws fabric. <laughs> 
to wear in middle school. <laughs> he said he could not wait to ruin that shirt. <laughs> in the summer, he slept on the porch more often than not because it was cooler than the inside of that trailer. Oh, the stories he told about his child in Las Vegas. From sitting on the rooftop with his family, watching the atomic bombs go off, to mobsters being shot down in the street. He lived and grew up in the best of times, he would say. George had one sibling, a younger brother, Richard. He would often take Richard with him as he left each summer morning to go scout out something to do. But there were those times he didn't want his little brother hanging around. So one particular time, he did not want to babysit Richard. So he came up with a solution. He left Richard tied to a tree with a hose running over his head. <laughs> it was summer, after all, and he did want to take care of his little brother. He was chased to the belt for that one, he laughingly said. <laughs> Growing up, George spent countless of hours in, in the uninhabited desert, exploring, hunting rabbit, and generally just kicking up dust. The stories he told revealed that he was a curious and mischievous kid. He liked to build things like go-karts and other motorized inventions. He and his friend even started a fire once, by accident, of course. It was the end result of performing some sort of wild experiment. I think it was had something to do with settling or something. I don't know. <laughs> Luckily, no one got hurt, and the damage was not too bad. His family went to their local Episcopal church most every Sunday, where he served as an altar boy up to the age of almost 17. When George was about 11 or 10 or 11 years old, his mother had an appendicitis. The doctor came out to the house and right there in the bedroom, he took her appendix out. George never forgot waiting outside the bedroom door and seeing all of the blood afterwards. George got his first job around junior high age. He delivered newspapers for the neighborhood and continued doing so clear up through high school. He learned very early that a job was the only way to get what you wanted and he kept that work ethic all of his life. Although growing up in Las Vegas, he never entered into the world of gambling. He worked too hard for his money, he would say. Those casinos are not built because the house loses. George and Richard's parents divorced when George was 16. Conveniently, after the, divor the divorce, each parent bought a bar right down the street from each other. <laughs> Tug of war with George was the name of the game. George would go back and forth and work between the, the two working uh, for his parents at, the bar, at each one's bar. Being in bars came early and very easy to George. There were only about 45,000 people living in Las Vegas in the 50s. The men wore suits and ties and the women put on their best dress for a trip to the casino. Most of all, the roads were dirt and very few houses had air conditioning. He said that when the casinos turned corporate in the 80s, that's when things really started to change in Las Vegas, for the worse. President John F. Kennedy drafted George into the Army just after he turned 18 years old. He began his three-year military service in March of 1962. After boot camp and before being shipped off to Vietnam, he ver voluntarily signed up to be part of the 82nd Airborne Division. He had 42 jumps under his belt. 12 of which were night jumps. His military service would take him overseas like so many others to Vietnam. He was told that his group were going there as advisors, but he quickly learned that they really didn't do much advising. It was war, unofficial, but war. George did not talk much about his time in the military, but on the occasion he did, you could sense his change of mannerisms. We just didn't talk about it much. Upon completion of his tour of duty, George returned home to Las Vegas. He made his home inside the local bars. 
Neighborhood hangouts where everyone knew everyone and where he would meet a couple of his future wives. Yes, I said wives. <laughs> Bartenders, drinkers, and gamblers, he referred to them as. George told stories of riding his horse down to the local bar because he knew he could climb on him and he, the horse, would take him home. Oh, and he even drank on occasion with Joe Vega and Bert Boschweiler. They live up here. Isn't that funny how the three of them ended up here in the White Hills uh, over the course of their lives? George was always a dog lover. Loved dogs. And it was Double Barrel and Shotgun who terrorized the neighborhood, George's neighborhood in those days. And two really, really scary toy poodles. <laughs> <laughs> Straight out of the military, he was lean, mean, and although only ten, uh, five foot ten and 155 pounds, he never ever backed down from a fight. He told me many stories about what he referred to as his drinking days. He always made me laugh telling these stories. He was a comical s storyteller and very animated. George was left-handed, a southpaw, some call it. He said he usually won the fights because of his hefty, unsuspecting southpaw. He gained quite the reputation back in the day. At least that's what he bragged to me about. But he did have the scars, knife scars, and dis disfigured fists from dislocating his joints to prove it. Even with all of his carousing, and he was a carouser. Even, even with all of his carousing, fighting, and drinking, George always held a job. He bought his first house in the early 1920s on a VA loan. He told me he paid almost $12,000 for it. A two-bedroom, one-bath house that still stands today. I know because he and I looked it up not too long ago, just for giggles and grins. That house came fully furnished, carpeting, drapes, and a swamp cooler, I think he said. No air conditioning, I think it was swamp cooler. As a young man, he worked several different jobs while attempting to find his way in the world. He worked as a bus boy, a full-service gas station attendant. He worked at the ice house, the bottling plant, worked as a milkman, went to school for heating and air conditioning, and worked in the tunnels at the Nevada National Security Site. He went to Alaska to work on the Alaskan pipeline and to pan for gold. <laughs> After all of this, he settled on what would be his life's career, engineering. George was a storyteller. He proudly told stories, like a badge of honor, about back in those days. And I loved to hear him. He told me a story once about the time, a time when he was working at the bottling plant. His job was to pull the newly filled uncapped bottles of pop off the belt that still had something in them, like cigarette butts, cockroaches, and so forth. <laughs> Things that didn't come out of the wash before filling. This particular day, like every other ordinary day at that time, he went to work with a bad head. He said he slid into the plant's parking lot on his motorcycle in a rush to arrive on time. So picture him with a bad head. Drinking a bottle of cola while working the conveyor. And he sets the bottle down. Well, ready for another swig of cola, he reaches over, picks up the wrong bottle, and swigs down a gulp with cockroaches in it. <laughs> He said that even today, if he thought too long on it, the gag reflex would still be triggered. <laughs> oh, and that milkman job? Well, he told me once that this was one of his favorite jobs. I had a nap. Laughingly, he said, you know the jokes about the neighborhood milkman? Well, they were not all just rumors and jokes. <laughs> yeah, if I recall correctly, he told me he had to quit that job. <laughs> George's hobbies throughout his years were many. He was an avid water skier, owned speed boats. He built flying airplanes, rode a motorcycle, built a sand rail for the sand dudes, a dune buggy, a UTV, just to name a few. George did not hire much work out. He was a hands-on kind of man. He loaded his own ammo, enjoyed target shooting, and making the ground shake with Tannerite. <laughs> he enjoyed flying his drone and taking the Dobermans on desert rides. 
one might describe George as hardworking, hard playing, and self indulgent. <laughs> one of his hobbies was restoring classic cars, and he was very good at it. George restored 10 classics in his lifetime. He enjoyed entering them in car shows and receiving recognition for his hard work. The 1962 Ford Galaxy 500 convertible was his masterpiece. It took first place in just about every car show it was in. He earned quite a reputation within the local car clubs. Marriages. <laughs> George was married five times in total. The first marriage was to a 16-year-old Utah girl when he was about 18 or so. Her parents cut wind of that, had it annulled within months, and he never saw her again. <laughs> Heck, he couldn't even remember her name. It was so short-lived. I, you couldn't remember. <laughs> His second marriage was in 1970 to a bartender at one of the local from one of the local hangouts. They had two boys during their three-year marriage, and but things fell apart after he found out that the newest baby was not his. Their mother moved to Florida with the new father taking his toddler and of course the infant with her. She married that person and sent adoption papers to George asking him to sign over the boys for adoption by her new husband and he agreed. He thought it was the right thing to do as Florida was a long, long way away and he would probably never see his son again and he never did. He carried that grief silently in his heart all of his life. George resolved to never father another child, and he medically made sure of it. His third marriage in 1975 was to an older woman. She had four children already, three girls and a boy. That marriage ended every other week, he said. <laughs> every other week he would be loading up his things in his boat and pulling out. It's safe to say that that was not a match made in heaven. And it was short-lived. In 1979, he marries Joanne. She has two young girls. George was in his mid-30s and was settled down quite a bit by now. He only went to the bars on the weekends instead of every night. He said that after 15 years and with all of the traveling required for his job as a corporate engineer, and her demanding career as a casino cage manager, they just grew apart and had nothing more in common. Their marriage ended amicably in 1994. Oh, and here's a fun fact. All of these marriages took place at the Justice of the Peace. <laughs> Not a wedding one. It was a Vegas thing, he said. But he never once suggested to me that we get married at the Justice of the Peace. When George spoke about these past lives, I seemed to get the feeling that he had been searching for and wanting a family all his life. George was a very skilled man. He had acquired several licenses and certificates during his lifetime. A water treatment license, an electrician's license, heating and air conditioning certification, and engineering qualifications. When he finally settled down into engineering as his career, he was very successful. And he was very good at what he did, and he began to climb the proverbial ladder. He worked his way up to corporate vice president, chief engineer for Western Linen. He wore a suit and tie to work and traveled to California and Florida to oversee the laundry operations in those plants. During his time at Western Linen, he was recognized and given a $20,000 bonus, a lot of money in the 80s, <laughs> valued about 60000 today. He received that bonus for overseeing the building of the world's largest linen plant at that time, of course. Las Vegas, the city of hotels, needed that laundry plant, and it was quite a big deal. Anyhow, when Western Linen sold, George went to work for Marriott as chief engineer at a laundry plant in California. That's where we met. After five years of working in California, he had enough and decided it was time to move to, back to Las Vegas. He went home to Nevada 
and finished his engineering career working at Valley's Hotel Casino. Melanie and I went with him. During his retirement, George diligently worked on his ancestry for three years or so. He enjoyed reconnecting with his family members and spent hours talking on the phone with them. During his research, he learned, that many, learned many interesting things about his ancestry, such as the two brothers who fought in the Civil War side by side and lived. They'd go on to live and raise their families just acres away from each other for the remainder of their lives and died just months apart. He also learned that he was a descendant of one of the kings of England. Boy, that really got to his head. <laughs> he even suggested that I call him Your Highness. <laughs> we just laughed and laughed. <laughs> he, um, however, it was learning that his parents were not married until 1946. Three years after he was born, that was the most scandalous. He learned that his mother was married before marrying his dad. He found pictures of him as a baby with their with this first husband and his mother. There were also pictures of him as a very young child with his mom and his dad. Was he a Harrison by birth? What was really going on? He settled on the fact that his birth certificate said Harrison and that was good enough for him. And he liked believing he was a descendant of royalty. <laughs> I met George in 1998 and when our eyes first met, it was as if I could see myself in him. It's a good day for me, he replied, as his eyes, which were a strikingly divine color of blue, beamed, and his lips smirked as if he was hiding a secret. A boyish grin followed his response. The right side of his upper lip raised slightly, and he waited eagerly as if in secret anticipation at catching me stumble over my reply to that. My question wasn't an unordinary one, how do you do? It did not require much forethought or rehearsal. However, his answer did catch me off guard and intrigued me. This was our first introduction and his positive energy instinctively got my attention. Those feelings never left me, even though I would not see him again for eight months. On October the 21st, 2000, George and I were married at the Tropicana Wedding Chapel. He had just turned 57 and me, at 38, felt so safe and secure with Georgie by my side. I loved him with all my heart. Our first years together were full of hard work and fun. We worked on home projects together, traveled and enjoyed day outings in his rebuilt 1956 Ford two-door hardtop with the 460 engine that he put underneath the hood. <laughs> We enjoyed our couple time together and spent time with our friends. We went to Kauai twice, took in a lot of music concerts, went to the NFR PB, PBR and saw Las Vegas shows. We both worked full time, but we always made time for those day outings in his 56. George loved the desert and he loved to show it to me. He also included Don, Anthony, and Melly in plenty of those outings in the 56 and boating on Make Lee. Anthony went with us to Kauai on our second trip, and he took Melanie and me to Disneyland for her 16th birthday. Even with his rough edges and steadfast ways, I always knew that he wanted to be part of our lives. And trust me. I didn't always make it easy for him. Me with my 38 years of heavy baggage. <laughs> George never lost his love for building things and projects. He started building our retirement home here in White Hills at the age of 62 as an owner builder. Load by load, he crossed that dam with materials and tools and the dogs. He loved it. I would continue working full time until he finished and then together we would travel the states. We started those plans in 2004. Yep, we had it all figured out. <laughs> but the Almighty had other plans for our lives. In 2006, we became emergency foster parents of Patrick, Brittany, and Kylie. 
George was retired, working on building our house, and I had just turned 44 and was working full time. The children were 10 months, 23 months, and almost four years old. What a challenging time in our marriage and our lives overall. It's hard to believe that we got through the next 14 plus years and managed to stay together. It was only by the grace of God that we did. George spent a lot of time here in White Hills working on our house and I continued working full time and took care of the children. Him spending a lot of time here working on his newest and grandest project is what enabled us to remain together, I think. <laughs> that and our committed and stubborn ways about us. <clears throat> And our love for each other helped too. What started out to be a temporary situation became a permanent one and together we adopted Patrick, Brittany and Kylie as our own in 2008. George insisted I stop working the, the, working the following year to be a stay-at-home grandmom to the children. I didn't put up too much of a fight about this as I was physically exhausted and was suffering emotionally and he knew it. From day one, George was a committed family man, a protector and a provider. He and I did not necessarily jump for joy at being put in this position at this time of our lives, but we were committed to it and took raising these three babies seriously. George took us on vacations to places like Disneyland, the San Diego Zoo, SeaWorld, Knott's Berry Farm, and the Lehman Caves. We, yeah, that's where Brittany broke her arm. <laughs> we went on regular outings to places like the Nellis Air Force Base Air Show, the opening of the Hoomer Dam, Dam Bypass, Bonnie Springs, the Springs Preserve, Spring Mountain Ranch, Sunset Park, Tule Springs, Mount Charleston in the winter to play in the snow, Chuck E. Cheese, and Scotty's Castle in Death Valley. That's a really neat place. Remember that, kids? Mm -hmm. He took us boating camp and camping, took us to the Circus Circus and the Las Vegas Mini Grand Prix. He went to every single football, little league, and softball practice and game and cheered the loudest while he was there. And yeah, he did change a diaper or two. <laughs> Funny story. One day I had to work. It had to be a holiday or something because the kids did not have preschool or daycare. Under protest, he agreed not to go to White Hills <laughs> and to stay at home and watch the three children. Naturally, he was faced with dirty diapers during the day. So what did he do? <laughs> he took Brittany and Connie outside and hosed them off. <laughs> he got them cleaned up and put new diapers on them. I think that was the only diaper change they got that day because I came home to soaking wet diapers on Brittany and Kylie, but not a dirty one. <laughs> George was, involved, was an involved father to the kids. He was committed to us and showed his love towards us in so many ways. He took time to teach important skills, not only with patients, not all, no, I meant not always with patience, <laughs> but he did try. He tried hard to pass on what he knew. He was devoted, kind, comical, and generous. He could be braggadocious, exaggerative, and very charming. He could also be harsh, intimidating, <laughs> demanding, sharp-tongued, and he threw pepper tantrums. <laughs> However, the one thing that sticks out most of all to me is George, he was a forgiving man. Yes, he could hold a grudge, and in some cases that I know of, it could last years. But he learned how to change that part of his personality. He learned how to let bitterness go and to walk in forgiveness. He understood that we all, including himself, needed forgiveness. And I didn't mind reminding him a time or two. <laughs> Our family left Las Vegas and moved here full time in 2015. I joined Celebrate Recovery in Kingman, joined our community church, and our life began to settle down some. 
Oh, we still had three children at home who were tweens and a teen. But with Melanie and Gary's help, we managed to get through the past five years okay. And George would live to see Patrick to adulthood. During these last years, George enjoyed, enjoyed talking on the radio with his best buddy, Earl. They went to the steakhouse on occasion, had many, many biscuits and gravy at my house, and joined in at some local functions. Earl passed away on the 15th of August last year. Georgie was grieved deeply. Lori Ann and I both noted that how they both passed on the 15th of the month. During his last years, George enjoyed piddling around the house and always seemed to have a project going. He took time to teach children about home, yard, and auto maintenance, ran the dogs ragged, and took many, many naps. <laughs> we learned that he had leukemia in late 2018, and together as a family, we faced that with courage, determination, and faith. He responded well to treatment, and within a year, his white cell count would return to and would remain within normal limits. He would need to remain on the medication for life, but he was a fighter and overcame this battle. George began slowing down some, but still had energy enough to run the dogs and be involved in the children's lives, teaching, them, teaching and instructing them and of course, eating his favorite meals. <laughs> and then came the China virus. George contracted the virus in November 2020. He fought hard to beat it, but with his weakened respiratory system from smoking for 50 years, which he gave up years ago, by the way, and his battle with leukemia, his body was just not able to win this fight. George was hospitalized on November the 29th, and after 16 days in the hospital, his illness had taken a turn for the worse. The doctor called on December 14th, asking me to come in and speak with him. I did not want to go alone, so Anthony and Melanie arranged to go in with me the next day. We knew we were gonna say goodbye, and I'm so grateful to the doctor and he allowed the three of us to suit up from head to toe and be, be at his side. George passed away peacefully on December the 15th. At 12.30, yeah. Melanie and I were by his side, holding his hand and talking to him during the last hour of his life. I pointed out to Melanie how the heart rate boost, how his heart rate boosted up 10 or 12 beats. At one point, while we were talking to him, I'm certain he heard us speaking to him there as he slept. Melanie plays video goodbyes from Dawn and Patrick, Gary, Julia, Scarlett, and Abraham. And I read Brittany's letter to him and told him what Kylie wanted me to say for her. I read the 23rd Psalm, the Beatitudes, the Lord's Prayer, and other scripture to him. George was a believer in Christ Jesus as a savior. He passed peacefully with Melanie and me by his side, each holding a hand. Second Corinthians 5.8 says, we are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Georgie is now in the presence of the Lord. And I, we, are so blessed to have had him in our lives. No one has or ever will love me as you did, Georgie. Thank you for all you did and gave to me. You certainly left your mark in this world and in our lives, and we loved you for it. I loved you for who you were, all of it. 
You know, I used to tease George on occasion during one of his grumpy moves, saying, Georgie, you are, you are a little rough around the edges, but mostly lovable as is. He would laugh and say, so are you, baby. <laughs> George always did have a sense of humor. He was quite a guy. My daughter Melanie would not come up for a reading of Isaiah 25, 8 and 9. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all the faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and we will rejoice in his salvation. And Patrick will now come up for a reading of Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path, paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yet though, though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy, mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. 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 I would like to take this time to invite those to share their sentiments to come out of. You need a boost, baby, so you can see. You can stand in front, honey. Bud. Stand right here, buddy. Stand right here, baby. Say something right about there. Poppy. Right. Say, talk about Poppy. <laughs> You could look around wherever you want, baby. Get something out. I had to figure something out to say first. Okay, <laughs> think about it. anything you want, baby. Did you love Poppy? I love Poppy. Oh. Yeah. Nice. Oh. He loved you too, baby boy. <coughs> okay. I'd like to share a. Um, so I have one that always makes me like happy when I think of this moment. Right after George finished building their, their beautiful home, I flew out here to go to a concert with Charlene. And so it was the first time I was in the home, you know, and they showed it to me and stuff. And so that part was special because I got to see George's home. But Charlene was in the bathroom or whatever, and it was just the three of us there at the house. And, and George comes up to me and he's like, hey, you're one of them dudes that's like chocolate, right? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I like chocolate, George. <laughs> Let me show you something. And he laughs, you know, he's got this little inside little giggle. He carries me, walks me around the corner into the kitchen and he opens a pantry. And he's got like a little... I don't know, like a gold mine of chocolate chips. <laughs> <laughs> Baking chocolate. <laughs> and he is so excited to show me his... He's like, Charlene doesn't even know I make these things. <laughs> I'm sure you did. No, I didn't. <laughs> he took them from the baking cabinet. <laughs> and so he says, he says, you know, this is my stash. <laughs> so, and I turned and everything and that was the funniest thing. And so we sat there in the corner while she was in the bathroom eating these chocolate chips. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and he just thought it was so funny that she had no clue he was hoarding the chips. <laughs> so that's a nice little memory I always... 
<laughs> All right, I'm going to say something about it. So, just kidding, it's not a, you know, you, just, you said you share a memory. So, just something I always remember as you were talking about that, Ford, and I'll never forget when you guys, I think it was Cherry's Jubilee in Monterey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He brought that 56 Ford. Is it a Fairlane or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we just cruised back and forth up and down Cannery Row in Monterey. Probably the same song playing the, for the whole entire time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the windows down. He had lights underneath it that lit up on yes, the ground. Did. And it was ridiculous, but it was the funnest thing. We just like felt like we were teenagers again, driving just up and down Cannery Row, and people were pointing at his car because it was just beautiful, you know? But I mean, I just remember that just being a really fun time that we had. And so I just wanted to share that. And then again, about him, just something I wanted to share that I, just something about his personality that I think everybody in here will know. One of them is dudes. Everybody in here was probably remembered being called dudes by him, you know? And he liked to be, you know, you said grumpy, but some of it was an act because he wasn't as grumpy as he acted a lot of times. Mm -hmm. You know, he led on to it, but he would tell us, ah, you dudes are here again. I didn't invite you here. What are you doing here? <laughs> then he would immediately welcome you in and treat you like yeah. just a great host. You know, he just, and he and you knew that he was teasing you. What are you dudes doing here? I don't even love you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I could sit with him and talk for hours. Just that's it. I'd sit there and talk with him for hours. For hours. Uh, and I just, me and him, I mean, I instantly knew I loved this guy. I have always got along with him so good. But one of the things I just loved about him is his no-nonsense personality. He just wasn't a guy for fluff. You know, no-nonsense. And, and you knew, you never were, you never had to guess about how he felt about you or anything. He was very honest. He was blunt and forward in a good way. And that's what I loved about him, his honest character. And also... Uh, that grumpy thing that you were talking about, he would crack. That would crack. You know, you'd be like, you know, when, you know, you dudes, I don't even, what are you doing? And then you'd say something back at him, just be just as harsh back at him. And that look on his face, that he crack, you know, you'd see it in his eyes, yeah. get like a smirk smile, kind of like, <laughs> he loved you it. knew he like he you knew he liked it. He liked you coming back at him with it, and he he was enjoying your company. You knew he did. He let you know with his eyes and a little smirk once in a while. But I love George, and I. I'm going to miss him a lot. So. Thank you, Rick. I want to thank everybody for being here, for my mom and my family. I want to thank everybody for all the hard work that you guys have put into this and all the love that you guys have put out for us. I really appreciate it more than you guys know. Um, I'm going to try to get through this. Um, you guys heard in the eulogy that we met my dad in 98. And um, I was the child of divorced parents. And my birth father was not a great father to me. And my dad, George, which is my dad, he was the best dad to me. He loved me. He treated me like his daughter from day one. He taught me things. He taught me how to be tough, how to not put up with bullshit. He taught me how to shoot guns, how to do oil on cars. Like my dad taught me how to drive the, the stick in the dune buggy. My dad was a hard ass, but it was everything that I needed growing up. I was, I had, I was very little when I met him. I was only 11, and I'll never forget the day that I met my dad. Um, I didn't know then uh, how important that he was going to be to me, but I'm thankful that you guys met, and I'm thankful that he loved you, and I'm thankful that he loved me. And the day that I met my dad, um, he decided he wanted to take my mom out on a date. And he had been on a couple of dates with my mom at this point. And um, it was one of those times where mom had been going out with this guy, and she says, There's somebody I want you to meet. So I knew that it was going to be somebody important. 
I'm like, all right. So I get up and I get dressed and I get ready and everything and um, we pull up into the parking lot and he pulls up in his truck and he just got out and he just had, I don't know, just very swagger, very um, polite and he opened up the door for me and I got out of the car and we went out, um, to, I believe we went out to ice cream the first time that we ever I ever hung out with him or got to meet him and I'm pretty sure it was ice cream mm -hmm. but I just remember him the very from day one he always treated me kindly he always treated me respectfully he always he did not treat me like I was just some little kid he treated me as an adult the way that he would handle me and talk to me he treated me with respect from the day that I ever first met my dad. And that was something that was um, very different for me, being a child and everything. And I just, it was something that I noticed and I, I really appreciated. And growing up throughout the years, I was not the easiest teenager. I was very rebellious. I went through many different phases, but all through that, I could always talk to him about anything. It didn't matter what I was doing, it what did not matter what situation I was in, what I was up to, I could talk to him about it. He would keep it to himself between us, and he would give me sound advice, which I could choose to listen to or not. But if I didn't listen to it, I better not go whine about the problem again back to him, because then I'm never going to hear the end of it. But he was a really good dad. And for a guy that... I guess didn't really want kids after he was burned once in the past. He sure did end up with a lot of them. <laughs> he ended up with a lot of them, and he loved us all. Six, Six kids he raised, and um, I'll never, I'll never forget him. And I'm extremely proud and thankful to be his daughter, and I will continue to make him proud. I know I have. He's told me many times how much he loves me, how proud he is, and I will continue to do that, and I will never, ever, ever forget you, Daddy. Yeah. So thank you, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it, guys. Go ahead, Gary. Uh, hey, everybody. Um, I'm Gary. I'm George's son-in-law, married to Melanie. We've got three beautiful daughters. Or children. children. <laughs> um, my head is not in the right spot right now. But, man, George, there's a lot of good things I could sit here and talk about George with. My dad is not the best dad out there, honestly, and it's been such a great blessing to have George be there and be such a great father, role model, um, big support, and big mentor of mine for a very, very long time. Best man ever out there, best husband out there, the best brother, the best father, the best every single aspect that you can even think of. That man was absolutely great. He gave a lot of crap, but if he didn't give you crap, he didn't really like you a whole lot. <laughs> That's just how it is. Um, but man, it, it's been a, a very long time, and I'm super, super thankful that. I was able to have such a great time with him and to be able to have such a great person to look up to and uh, have a lot of big, huge footsteps to follow and try to lead in and everything. He is one heck of a man. And one story I can't ever forget, that facial expression that he gave me when I came home from Connecticut, that proudness and that happiness as soon as he saw me, he's like, oh, how was it, how was it? And was so excited and happy that they were wanting me to go back out there and everything else and hearing all the stories of him moving around and doing all that stuff and everything with the engineers. It was it was awesome. I've had a lot of shared a lot of good stories with him anytime I've ever had an issue with anything. If I didn't call him first, I was getting it. I'll just say that. <laughs> and then you give me the blueprints right there and say, Okay, this is exactly how to do it. Triple check your work. <laughs> but George uh George is a great, great man, and I honestly, I'm so grateful that I've seen all these beautiful, beautiful faces and everything, and, and it's awesome. George is, uh, George is a very blessed and honored man in every single which way, and I'm just going to try to do it justice for him and you, live Gary. up to him as much as I can, and I think every man here is going to try to do that, because 
is one hell of a man, and that is for sure. But. Thank you, Gary. Yep. We love you. Anybody else would like to say anything, or should we continue with the reading? Um, oh, Miss Linda? <laughs> if, if there's no more family that wants to go. Oh, no, anybody can go anytime. Yeah, anytime. I just want to say I did not know George very well. I've only talked to him a couple times. He seemed like a great guy. But I can tell by his family how much we love you girls and, and your mom and your sister and your aunts and um, the little ones. They're just so beautiful and they're so wonderful. And I know he had to be a pretty great guy to be with you guys. <laughs> and it's very obvious that you guys really loved him. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. John 14, 1 through 6. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. It's okay, honey. Take your time. Take your time, sweetheart. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, that you may be also, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to, them, to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. My sister Kylie will now come up for the reading of the blessing of Saint Francis of Assisi. I'm not sure. The blessing of Saint Francis of Assisi, right? Um, I think so, Kylie. Okay. The Lord bless you and keep you. May He show His face to you and have mercy. May he, uh, may he turn his uh, countenance uh, to you and give you peace. The Lord bless you. My mom will now come up to close the service and, ish and initiate the balloon release. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for coming. It really means a lot to me. A lot of faces I didn't expect to see. Uh, maybe that I expected that I don't, but that's okay. Um, I don't know what else to say about Georgie. He was, he was one of a guy. He was very stubborn. Yeah, he could be stubborn. Yeah. <laughs> I think we should talk about Dad's love for his dogs. Oh, <laughs> those yeah, poor those dogs. dogs. <laughs> He cried for a week solid when Maggie died recently. Mm -hmm. One of our dober ones. <laughs> oh, the dog sentiments? Well, I'm sure folks have read them, but I'll read them. Yeah. Inside the program, you'll see the family sentiments. Down at the bottom are the, uh, the dog ones. He loved those dogs. <laughs> Let's read for the first one. It says, My daddy would always let me sit on his lap and nap with him. He did make fun of my haircut sometimes, but that was okay because I was napping in his lap. Hampton, 11 years old, toy poodle. <laughs> I would sit and stare at my daddy for hours at a time in admiration. He was my best friend and always called me pretty girl. JC, 10 years old. Doberman. 
My daddy rescued me from an abusive home when I was six months old. I ended up disabled because of the abuse, but my daddy always loved me and told me what a good boy I was. Hans, six years, Doberman. When I was alive, my daddy would throw me treats from across the room and I would catch him in midair. He's in heaven with me now, and there is an endless supply of treats and roads for dog runs. Maggie, Doberman. Maggie's rolling up there. Endless pig ears. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and the bacon bits. <laughs> we have some balloons here, and um, some of them got a little deflated over the night, but um, I think they'll still pass. From the cold. Oh, yeah, from the, the cold weather. Hopefully, they'll still release. Um, Melanie's going to lead the balloon release. And what uh, we're, I'm going to stay, I believe I'll stay, and I'll help set up, and then we'll have some fellowship. We'll have a meal at the fellowship, and everybody look at the pictures, and don't forget to sign the book, and um, we'll just have a good time of visiting. Hopefully they go up. Hopefully they go up. I'm going to wait for everybody to come out.